Hey guys, so just wanted to make a video. This isn't an underrated series or anything. I just really felt like making a video, um, a video analysis or a technical breakdown of Virgilius Alekna, um, who I still believe is the GOAT for discus throwing. Two-time Olympic champion, two-time world champion, one-time bronze medalist at Olympics. And overall, I think he has the most 70 meter throws. I, th I think it's, I think he has Gerd Cantor beaten, uh, the former uh, championship record holder, world championship record holder, the current Olympic record holder, although I don't know for how much longer. Um, has, uh, geez, I guess now the third longest thrower ever at 73.88. Um, just got moved down, was the second before his son, Mikola Selekna, beat the world record uh, a week or two ago. But yeah, I mean, his dad, uh, Virgilio Selekna, and I'm sorry if I'm butchering that name. Um, I, I'm, I'm not Lithuanian, but he's, he is just something else. And his t just his technique, I mean, I could, him and Gerd Cantor, I think probably are like the two best technical throwers ever. Like if you want an, a reverse thrower, I mean, I don't know. You just can't beat them. I mean, they're just so aesthetically pleasing to watch. They're just, it's just everything is so effortless when they throw. Like every position is just down to a T. It is just something of beauty. They all, they had both had super long careers. I mean, I don't know what you can say. I mean, but I do think as much Gerd Cantor is my favorite out of the two. But I can't deny, I mean, you know, Alekna is just he's just he's just the GOAT. I don't even know what to say. I mean his son is pretty good, I guess, you know, if you're into the world record and whatnot. But yeah, I mean I don't think his son has overtaken him as the GOAT. Because I think his son has to actually win some Olympics and stuff and some worlds. But yeah, so let's just let's just break down this throw. First, let's just watch. I think this is like a 71 meter throw. I mean, I mean, just look at this throw. I mean, it's just it's just a thing of absolute beauty. I mean, I'm sorry if I'm, you know, gawking a little too much, but I mean. His technique is just so on just such another level. I mean, I think it's I think it's still better than his son's. I think his son just has better modern training, got to learn from his dad. Not to say his son has bad technique or anything, but you know. I think if his dad was at Ramona, oh my lord, he would have thrown like 76 probably. I mean, you do 73 meters with wind, granted. You know, you don't throw that far without wind. I mean, but I, I still think he could have broke the world record if he went to a meet like Ramona where it's just like a hurricane out there, basically. But I'm not here to talk about that. I'm not here to talk about his son. I'm here to talk about the GOAT himself. So let's break down his technique. So a couple things you got to know. If I remember correctly, he's around like six foot nine, two eighty to three hundred pounds, lean, shredded. I think he has like a seven six wingspan, like some ridiculous wingspan. I mean, you can just tell. I mean, he just got monkey arms. I mean, he's just just he's just a physical specimen. And the other thing you gotta know about him is he is super flexible, like uber flexible, uber mobile is a better word for that, but, I mean, there's a whole video on YouTube, it's like an hour long of just his pre-warm-up routine, and he has, like, a whole team around him for the 2009 World Champs, um, and it's just his whole team, he's just getting massage, he's getting, uh, rolled out, he's getting, um, mobility drills, he's, he's just getting a whole bunch of stuff done, um, and yeah, it's like a whole hour long, Granted, you know he's older and stuff. Like the older you get uh, in the sport, the more you have you have to do the warm up. You know, just because it just takes more than when you're younger. But I mean, it, it's 
it's crazy like how flexible and how mobile he is for the size he is. Is honestly, it's it's crazy. I mean, he is. I mean, I I I think it's a given that you know the still seventy three meters in discus. You know, you have to you have to be somewhat of an athlete. You know, yeah, I can't get anybody off the street and throw that far. So, but you know, so again, the, those are two things because those are two very important things that you're gonna have that we're gonna um keep going back to is his. Uh, those two physical attributes, his height and weight, and his monkey arms, and his flexibility. I guess it's more than two things, but whatever. I'm not a mathematician. But, so, first of all, super balanced wind. Um, honestly, starts a little offset. He usually doesn't start offset. Um... I don't know, maybe there was just a little spot in the ring or something that he didn't like, like a little, um, um, what is it, uh, like soft, not soft spot, you know what I mean, like if you ever throw in like a glass ring or something, or like, like there's like a spot that you, you're gonna slip on, you know, you start just a little bit offset, just to avoid that spot, so you just don't get that in your mind in like a competition or something, so maybe that's it, but I, from my memory, he doesn't he usually starts dead center. Um, so you know. But I mean, yeah, you know, he, he's pretty close to center. So I think that's what happened, but I could just be totally wrong. I don't know him. I don't know where this is. I'm assuming this was like a 70 plus meter throw. I think this was a 71 meter throw, if I remember correctly. One of many that he had. But yeah, so let's get to it. So Wines, you can already tell most people cannot have the discus this far back and keep it there. Like his flexibility is just on another level and it's going to play an important role because it's one of the things that makes him throw so far. So if you can handle having a 2K discus, a two kilogram discus back that far, like he, he, he kind of throws kind of like a woman in a good way. Because most men cannot throw like women. Um, and like the, the positions he hits are just absolutely insane. Like it, 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 it boggles the mind. Obviously you got to be super strong to handle those types of positions. But we'll get to that. You'll see it more in his power position or his stand throw position. Um, so let's, get, let's actually get out of the back of the ring. <laughs> So, turns, leads with the left foot, uh, right foot pick ups around, picks up around 90 degrees, so when his left foot is there, his right picks up. Kind of hard to tell because, you know, the quality of the video and whatnot, I don't know what year this is from, this is just from some completion on YouTube, um, but yeah, so, has a low left arm. Uh, here is over his left pretty well. So this back position, honestly, is pretty is, is a lot like his son actually. Um, or like he, he's not like super level out the back, like you know canter or something. You know he's just getting on top of his left foot. Um, kind of leading with the left knee and not and just thinking, just getting turned and then just being linear. Um. I do think this position is a lot better than his son. Um, not not to diss his son, but you know, that's just my opinion. Because I, I don't know, it ten, I tend to see that his son is just super blocked off. But I guess it doesn't matter if you're just a freaking athlete. But whatever. So, but enough about. I keep I keep talking about his son because you know, obviously he just broke the world record. But I'm trying to stay on topic because. I just get so excited when I talk about Virgilio Selecna. And I know it's very weird, but whatever. That's just me. So, keeps dropping the left arm. But if you notice, he drops the left arm. The shoulder is still up. So, he's not tilted down. He's just dropping the left arm. And this is where the height comes in. The six, the, the fact that he's six foot nine. It's very hard to stay in a discus circle when you're six foot nine. Like he's way taller than his son. I think his son is only like six four. Which is a pretty ideal height 
for disc and starting. Six nine is good. I mean, it doesn't hurt to be six foot nine. Actually, well, it kind of does in a way. The six foot nine is basically like the max height. I would say is good for discus throwing. Because anything past that, you know, you're just too big to actually throw and produce power at the heights that you would think. Um, like, obviously, like, so, like, the guy at um, ASC right now, that the freshman, or I guess, uh, is he a sophomore? I forget if he's a freshman or sophomore now. The seven-footer. You know, like, he, he throws, like, 65 or something in discus. I mean, like, but, I mean, like, you just watch him throw and, he just can't sprint because he's, you know, seven foot tall. So it's like, it's, it's basically impossible. And you can really see it when he throws shot put. <laughs> so, yeah. But, so like six foot nine, not that, you know, a lot of people have to worry about that because a lot of people are not six foot nine. But, <laughs> but you know, that's just something to keep in mind if you have like a taller athlete or you're a taller athlete. Um... You know, you can't do the same thing as, like, someone who's, like, six foot tall. Your technique has to be a little different. Otherwise, you won't be able to fit in the ring and generate power. Because, you know, like, Virgil Selegna cannot throw like your Cantor. Because your Cantor is 6'5". And Alecna is 6'9". <laughs> so, you know, it's 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 just different. And that's why they look complete. They look super different when they throw. But, you know, they both still threw over 73. So... You know, two throwers, two different styles, but pretty much the same result. You know, I like the threw further, but, you know, eh, tomato, tomato. But, yeah, so it gets here. Um, really like this position right here. So I like this wide sweep. I like leading with the groin and the, so the kind of soccer kick. Uh, I don't really like saying a soccer kick, but, you know, like the, the foot's dorsiflexed. The left foot is, I mean, the left arm is way past. So I, I don't, I don't like it when people don't use their left arm out the back because if you use your left arm correctly, it just helps you turn around easier than just saying don't use it. Because I think if you don't use it, it just makes you super robotic and not fluid. And you know, you have a left arm, use it. You know, it's like. It's like saying, oh, you have, you, have a, you, you have a left leg, so don't use it at the back. You know, it's like, it just doesn't make sense. You're throwing is a whole body movement. If, if it wasn't, then all we would do is just do a bunch of single arm, like, s single arm stuff. Basically, you just train like a freaking arm wrestler, basically. You know, but it's a whole body movement. You know, like, we don't just use our right side if you're right-handed. You know, you use your left side, so use it. So I, I just, it's just a big pet peeve of mine when people are like, just don't use your left arm because like, that's just dumb. You know, it's a whole part of your body that can make the throw really easy. Now you don't want to use it too much. That's where people get in the problem. Like you don't want to just rip out the back and just don't use your legs at all. But Alekna does it very nice where he's here and he gets to here. So his, his left arm and left knee are basically in line with each other he gets here when he does a heart he does this hard stop with his left foot which i really like because it sets the direction of the throw and allows him to the sprint super linear because if your left foot continues to turn you're not going to get a good sprint you're going to over rotate and you're going to what usually happens is you're going to over rotate so instead of instead of driving this way you're going to drive that way and all your energy is going that way, but you're going to try and throw down the middle. So what happens is you just yank at the finish and then just yeet it over here. So, you know, you want, you want to establish this, this connection. So left, so gets a lot of weight on this left foot, slams it down right here. And it just doesn't move until, until. He gets to turning, and what turn what turns him the rest of the way is his super active sweep leg, and the fact that he clears his left arm. So as he goes, he slams the left foot. The left arm continues to go, which helps his sweep leg go around. Still keeping the disc is really far back, and then his sweep leg turns him the rest of the way. So the part that his height plays into 
Now, normally you're taught to have a super level arm and to have long a long arm. Lars Riedel, who's like 6'7", also did this too. I don't know if Alekna got that from them. I don't know if they just do that naturally. But my theory is always, because I tend to see people that are pretty tall, like 6'7 plus, like 6'7 plus, I tend to see them have bent left arms that are slightly angled down. And I think the reason is, is because, and I could just be totally wrong, because this is just totally a theory of mine. Um, I do believe they do that because to help them stay in the ring and help them stay, not go too far across. Because it kind of pulls their center of gravity a little down when they do this, when they pull in. Like as you see here, so he's here and he pulls in and down with his left arm and kind of just tucks it into his hip. And that allows him not to travel too far across the ring and to, to keep weight over his right. And then he just keeps that elbow bent. And honestly, like his his middle to front looks a lot like Lars Riedel, who is also one of my favorite disco stars of all time. Who I, th I believe I made a video of in my underrated series. Um, but, yeah, I, I could just be totally wrong, and that's just something they just do because they, it just feels comfortable. Like, I know some... It's not really an issue, honestly. It, like, it, it's just curious, and the, the... What I'm trying to say. It's just curious to kind of think about, like, why they do that. Because, I don't know, I only notice really tall people do that. Um, but I don't, yeah, I don't know. Like, I personally did it naturally. And I still do it naturally. Like, just bend my left arm, it just feels natural to me. Um, you know, like someone like Adam Nelson, he didn't, well, he did, I know it's a completely different event. But, you know, like, his left arm. His left leg in from the in in the middle, like how it goes super high and super wide, and stuff. You know, that's just something he just did naturally, and it, you know, he threw far, so nobody really fixed it because you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So you know, I wonder if it's just one of those cases, or if he's actually doing that on purpose to try and stay in the ring, and not go too far across. I I don't know. I would love to know the answer because it's honestly been a, um, a question of mine for many, many years. So, yeah, that's just a hypothesis of mine. I could just be totally wrong. Um, and he just does it just for a totally different reason or he just does it naturally. Either way, he does it. So, it's not anything wrong, really. Because, you know, it's not like he's pulling. It's, it's not causing any trouble. If anything, it's helping him. So he gets here. I love his timing. So the second his right foot crosses his his uh uh his sweep. Sorry, <sighs> sorry. Uh, I'm really tired. <laughs> when his right foot crosses his sprint leg, so when his right foot crosses his left leg, that's when his left leg goes. So he has perfect timing here. So you always want to try and get off this left leg when the right foot is on is on this side of the ring it, all right you don't want to wait until it passes so like you he do, you don't want to be grounded when your right foot's here all right because what happens is you get off late you don't produce power out the back so you don't get that this this flight phase and you don't sprint out the back and the sprint is so important in throw in the throw because if you don't sprint you don't have direction to the throw you don't you don't you you lose all the energy that you did all the rotational energy you did uh all the rotational energy is is gone out the back you know it's just a lot of stuff if you don't like all of this that he did if he just kind of just stepped to the back like i mean stepped to the middle he he just did all that for nothing. It's just a, a walk through full at that point. So I mean, you you got to just get off the ground. And the other reason why you want the sprint leg is because the faster and harder you you sprint out the back, the faster that left foot is going to get down at the front. 
and the faster your right foot's going to get down in the middle. So that's this is the acceleration point. The sprint is basically where you accelerate. All right. You do need to carry momentum out the back, but generally the sprint is going to be the second fastest part of your throw. Where the first fastest, well, I shouldn't say fast, I say powerful. The most powerful, the second most powerful part of your throw with the first part, I mean, the first one being obviously your release. Your release should be the fastest, most powerful thing in the entire throw. If it's not, you got other issues. All right. So if you're having trouble with this timing, like uh, like what he has here, and again, that's super high level stuff. It takes years to get to this level. Like no beginner should even think about worrying for about this. Get the basics down. Like this is just some, like this timing stuff and whatnot. That's when you like. That's like down the road. Like you can touch it and stuff if you're like a first year, but. I wouldn't even worry about it, honestly. You just get the basics down because if you don't have the basics and the fundamentals of throwing, you're you're not even going to be worried about timing and rhythm and whatnot, you know, because, you know, you need to have fundamentals to actually have timing and rhythm. And once you have the fundamentals, the timing and rhythm will honestly just kind of come naturally usually. If it doesn't, then you have to work on it and there are drills and stuff that you can do for it, but, you know. For the most part, if you have the fundamentals and do everything right in the ring, you know, it'll kind of just work itself out, in my opinion. But, you know, again, I could also be wrong about that. It kind of came naturally to me, but, you know, whatever. Um, But let's get back to this. So this timing's super good. So land's super nice here. Ah, stop, stop turning. There we go. So lands, let me do one more frame. Come on, move. No, what are you doing? There we go. So super on top of, let me get a straight line. So super on top of his right, this is a stack. So what I mean by a stack is that his head, shoulder, butt slash hip, knee and foot are in line with each other and what's that what's going to happen is it's going to just stay like that and he's just going to turn around his left side and just smack the living crap out of the finish and he's just so balanced in his throw it's, it's just a thing of absolute beauty i know i've said that a bunch but oh my god i haven't actually watched him throw in quite some time because you know i was basically my entire childhood just watching him throw um, well, I shouldn't say childhood, like high school years, but <laughs> like him and Gert Cantor are like my, my absolute like heroes in discus. So, and in my mind, it's really hard for people to surpass that. I'm completely biased, obviously. Um, not to say that, you know, like Che or Stahl or, you know, Mikolas Elekna aren't great or anything, but you know, shoot, I don't know if you can beat Elekna and Cantor in their prime. I can't imagine the damage they would do nowadays, honestly, um, with modern day training and like resources and just a whole bunch of stuff. But yeah, but again, so we just work on the finish now. So not work on the finish. I mean, analyze the finish. So he gets here, bent knee. I'm just, oh my lord, I'm am I really that tired? Sorry guys. <laughs> bent elbow. Um. But if you notice through all of this, his shoulders stay level. So you can move your arm and not your shoulder. And that's a very important distinction. So he's not dipping with his shoulder. So his arm, is a, his left arm may be down, but his shoulders are still level right here. All right. His shoulders are still level. And yeah, and they're level here. And they're going to continually be level. So even though his arm is down and bent, his, his shoulders are still level. So that's the most important thing. Your shoulders your shoulders are the driving force of the orbit, the driving, the driving force of the direction of the disc. So the hip and the shoulders have to work in tandem with each other. So, you know, you can be super good with the hips, but... If your shoulders are tilted down and stuff, it's going to affect your hips and it's going to affect the throw. 
and vice versa, if your shoulders are facing super up, you know, you're going to probably just hop up in the air and not get a lot of force linear, linearly through the ring and whatnot. So, you know, it's a give and take. So for the most part, have level shoulders, have pretty level hips for the most part, you know, there, there are different variations, you know, obviously the hips are the driving force of the orbit, but you know, if you're moving your shoulders and whatnot, that's also going to affect the orbit as well. So, um, uh, you just, you just want to, uh, be aware of that. And again, I'm not really going to comment on his orbit because I actually made a video, um, about the orbit on my channel and I actually used him as a, um, technical model. So I'm not even going to touch on his orbit because I cover that at length and use him, um, in that video. So if you want to check that out and learn more about the orbit, you know, check that out, but yeah, and learn more about his orbit because I just talk at length. I think it's like a 20 minute video just about <laughs> basically his orbit <laughs> Well, it's about the orbit, but you know, I use him as the technical model because I think he probably had him and Gerd Cantor probably have like the best orbit ever. So again, also bias opinion, but I have a lot of biased opinions when it comes to uh, Gerd Cantor and Virgilius Selechna. So, you know, at me. But, yeah. So, it gets here. And one might think this is a bad release. And I'll tell you why it's not. And the reason why some people might say that is because, oh, he should... People would say, oh, he should be grounded. Um, you know, like Krauser or something. And, like, just keep pushing with this right foot. In discus, not especially important. I'm going to be quite honest. Because, you know, a discus does not weigh as much as a shot put. So a shot put, you want to stay grounded, I truly believe, because it just weighs more. So you need to push longer on it. And discus is further away from you. It's going to release not, not sooner. I mean, it's totally different timings. So it's going to take longer for the discus to release just because it just has to you know, come from here to here where like the shot put is attached to your neck. So it's going to take a, a lot shorter of a time for you to release. So it's just different release mechanics, kind of. Um, not really mechanics and in, in more of timing. Um, so you just have to be a lot more patient in discus compared to shot put. You still have to be patient on the release and shot put. Um, but it's just different. It's just totally different because they weigh totally the same. They're in totally different places and stuff. So I'm not even going to get into that in this video. But if you notice, so some people would say this is bad because, you know, he's not on the ground very long. Like he's off the ground when the discus is still in his hand and stuff. First of all, who really gives a rat or like who really gives a rip? Honestly, <laughs> because, you know, he's in competition you're no, nobody is technically perfect in competition. Um, everyone is usually at their best technically during practice, obviously, because you know, you're working on stuff and in a meet, your sole purpose is literally just to throw as far as possible. So, you know, you're not going to be as technically, um, proficient in a meet, which is why if you're looking for someone looking at like someone and you want to see them at the technically best try and find training footage of like really good training throws because that's usually when they are at their best like my favorite good canter video is honestly a 72 meter training throw um and that's honestly probably my favorite throw of his and Alekna has like a I think like a four like seven minute video of like him training when he was older but still and he has like videos of him throwing like 59 meters left-handed and just like He's just a freaking crazy guy. But, yeah. <laughs> um, but, yeah. So, in discus, you're going to move a lot faster. One, because the implement just doesn't weigh as much. And, two, because, because it just doesn't weigh as much, the sole purpose is just keep that momentum. Discus is a lot more momentum-based than shot put because, you know, it just weighs a lot less. So, you can be more momentum-based in, in your uh, in your approach to throwing discus. So he generates all this power. So let's play this at full speed. 
So you know, so if he was to grind the ground right there and just turn and like really feel grounded through the throw, it would slow him down. It would slow him down. And the most important thing is that he, even though he's not he's not grounded, his right foot's done pushing here. Base, and then his right foot takes over and he's transferring power onto his left foot. So this is the most critical part right here. So the disc is out of his hand here. He's still pretty much grounded with his left foot, I think. It's hard to... Yeah, yeah, he gets off here. So let's see. So he's here, boom, boom, boom. So he he's he's grounded still. So he's transferring forward, and I think that's a big problem that a lot of throwers have in discus is transferring forward onto their block, which is why non-reverser non-reversing in practice is really beneficial because it teaches you to work over your block and to have a block and whatnot. Um, and I think I made a video about that too, um, about reversers versus non-reversers and the benefits for both and whatnot. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just, it's just crazy. Um, his throw, but yeah, like to get back on topic, sorry, I just got a text and something, it just distracted me a little. Um, uh, to, sorry to get back on topic. Um, let's see. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I was talking about. Uh, so the right, the right hip is taking over. So the most important thing is the right hip turning into this left foot side. All right. So speed is the name of the game in discus. Obviously, you need to go fast in, in shot put as well. But because the shot put weighs a lot more, you know, it 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 takes a lot more pressure through the ground to throw far. Now, then again, people have also thrown far, not throwing like not like turning their foot all the way and stuff and like really like cranking their hips. So, you know, like you can get away with it if you're just like a physical specimen um, and stuff. So like the most important thing in the finish is getting your right hip through into your block. All right. So if you're having trouble with this, so like he still pushes against the ground. So he's like here and he still pushes against the ground and stuff. So, it's not like he's doing nothing with his right foot. I'm not saying that. You still need to actually push against the ground. But, like, like you take someone like Krauser. He's grounded in shot. He's grounded and, like, still pushing, basically, until, like, here. And then he picks up his right foot. Or, like, Elekna's off the ground and the disc is out of his hand. So, it's just it's just different thing. It's just a totally different... I shouldn't say totally different, but it's the, it's just the release. It's just it's just different, you know. Like people say, like the rotational shot and discus are pretty similar, but there are some differences, and this is one of them. This is one of them. It's just the timing and the kind of release mechanics that you need for discus compared to shot put. It's just different, but yeah. So super nice reverse, just stays in super easily, uh, and yeah. Let's just, just for fun, let's just watch this throw one more time. Just, just for the hell of it. Oh, my goodness gracious. That's the thing of beauty right there. Oh, man. But, yeah, I mean, overall, I mean, obviously he's the GOAT. It's going to be pretty hard, I think, for anybody to ever surpass him, in my opinion. And, yeah, I mean, he's just, he's just crazy. I mean, I can't even say much more. Oh my god, this is almost a 35-minute video. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. I, I was probably gawking for about 20 minutes um, <laughs> at him. So, yeah. I hope you guys enjoyed something. Uh, I know that I don't usually just do technical analysis, but I probably will actually do more. Because I, I kind of ran out of underrated throwers. I know there are some, and I'll still do the series. But, you know, I, I just sometimes just want to do technical models. Um, not technical models, sorry. Technical analysis of throwers that I just like, honestly. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, it's just, he's just so, he's, he's just so, he's just so freaking good at throwing, man. Uh, okay, uh, I'm just gonna 
switch off now. Thanks, guys, for watching, and hope you guys have a good day. Uh, see you later.